I'm delighted to be joined by the wonderful John Powell. Um, John is just coming off of the latest installment in the How to Train Your Dragon franchise and has most recently worked on projects like Solo, A Star Wars Story and Ferdinand and is about to take on Call of the Wild, uh, directed by Chris Sanders and starring Harrison Ford. So, John, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> Good. Um, I'd love to start out by asking you how you first got involved in music and when did you ultimately decide that film scoring was, was the right path for you? Got involved with music because my father was a was a, a musician, so I guess straight straight away, as soon as I was born, I was involved in music in some way or other. I suppose um, making a living at music is a tricky thing, so I think that's an evolution you go through uh, as you become a teenager and you work out whether or not you want to play a classical instrument or or a heavy guitar because that's more rock and roll, and more rock and roll means you know I don't know get more interesting to women. Um, and then you realize that that's not going to do you any good either because you're just not going to be cool enough to be a rock star. And so then you start to realize that you have to organize music. And really, that's all I do is I'm a composer, but I really like music. I like playing it, but I'm not really a good enough player. So I sort of organize it for everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and there's very few ways of making money at that. And um, I, when I came out of college, I was thinking of becoming a, a record producer. That was one of the things I wanted to do. I wanted to be Trevor Horn. And that proved to be tricky as well. Um, and while I was sort of trying to figure that one out, I ended up doing some jingles and realized that I quite enjoyed the variety that they gave me. Um, you know, one day I was doing some Greek bazooki music. The next day I was doing De La Soul covers. Yeah. And uh, like, uh, you know, I other was you don't be a, Jack of all trades, master of none. But actually, it turned out the one thing he was wrong about was that that turned out to be very useful for me to actually be a bit of a jack of all trades. And it's true, I'm not really a master of any of them, but I do, I do like to be able to sort of leap from one kind of music to another, uh, and I give it a good go. And perhaps the synthesis of all that is ideal for film scoring. Really, now where you have to have kind of a lot of uh, range, or it's not even having range; it's just having um, lots of influences. So that I think it, it became a slow burn effect of the idea of film music. Um, but it was always, it, from the minute I was born, I was clearly in a music family and I was always going to try and make music. It was the only thing that made any sense to me. Right. Now, um, we know you've scored many animated movies. Is there a big difference in approach to scoring for animation as opposed to scoring for a regular, uh, to call it what, a real life movie? Is by action. Um, by action, I guess, yeah. No and yes. Um, it depends what you want to write musically, and it depends what um, type of music they need in either film. I must admit that animation tends to have more um, busy music, um, more descriptive music, more, um, what's the word, uh, programmatic music, uh, whereas often live action is can be more about setting moods, uh, it's not as descriptive. Um, is, is that because you have to compensate for the lack of flexibility with animated characters, or no? It's it's simply because um, film directors uh, are always confused and and are trying to change their mind about whether or not they they're trying to create realism. And realism is not very lightly in animated films. You you, you just have to accept that the, the the realism is kind of is gone because it is animated, and that's the whole point of it. With filmmaking, obviously, we've we've changed. You know, the styles change over the years, but uh, but realism in film is is uh, in actual live action is you know you can go from Roma where there's no music and. Uh, but you have a camera that's being very unrealistic. It's making everything very beautiful um, to, uh, you know, Paul Greengrass films where, you know, he, he, he works incredibly hard to give you a feeling of being there. You're never observing in Paul's films. Mm. Uh, this idea of observance versus participation in a story is really key into filmmaking, you know, through, through all of cinema. Um, and the music in there can destroy the realism. Right. or it can enhance the participation. And so there are different requirements, I feel, for for this idea of the to and fro 
how much realism we want in live action animation that you can't you tend not to be able to kind of go go towards that argument so it, it is it is automatically more um i don't know um imaginative sure and since we're talking about animation um as i said I, you've seen great success um with how to train your dragon um, and the franchise um and hopefully you'll see even more success when it's released in the US. Um, with The Hidden World, how did you approach, uh, approach this with um, the fresh perspective? I mean, you have to reintroduce old themes, but you also want to inject a new spirit in them and, and give the audience something something new and exciting. Yeah, it was interesting. It wasn't just like a normal sequel. Was a, often with sequels, you, sequels you, you know that you know, you want it to be as successful as possible. You want it to be a continuation. You want it to be part of the uh, timeline uh, of the movies. And you think that you hope that there'll be a three, four, five, six, seven, whatever. Um, uh, with this one, there was a definite, deliberate decision to to finish. So it wasn't just about introducing anything new. It was introducing things that I could use to close the story. Mm. Um, so it made it very quite specific as to the material I needed. Obviously, I needed all the old material, but I needed to put that very, very carefully where I, where it would um, have the most impact. Sure. And then the rest of the material was all about, you know, the storytelling of a character, you know, a character who was finding a new love and a character who had to realize he had to make a decision that was going to be hard that nobody else could make and become a really ultimately become the leader that he'd always been sort of set up from the first movie. So all of those spelling functions needed to uh, needed certain material that I could, I thought I could, I could bring that, that the whole series to a close with. Right. Um, I actually, um, sat next to my mus musical son in the theater yesterday watching it. And every time the dragon racing theme came on, I got a hell of a nudge. It was his, it's his absolute favorite. So, so we enjoyed the, its reintroduction. Um, one of our members has asked, um, how do your ideas start? Do you sit at the piano and tinkle about and come up with a melody? Do you uh, just dive into different instrumentation and experiment with different sound palettes? What's your general process? Um, the general process is avoidance. Uh, because I find it very difficult. The first thing everybody should know is I find it very difficult. Mm. Um, this is not something I find easy. Um, I find it much easier to sit in front of the TV and watch Game of Thrones and, and drink beer. That would be my ideal sort of writing experience of okay. not writing. Sorry, we need to turn this damn phone off. Hang on. There we go. Um, uh, but so avoidance... But then I just sort of try and get to know the film mm. for a start. Uh, and then it, I can start by just fiddling on the piano. I might fiddle on a guitar. I might play around with playlists, believe it or not, and listen to other music and just try and find something interesting that um, triggers me um, to start. And then I start just writing fragments, bits and pieces that may become a suite or may n never see the light of day. Yeah. Um it's chaotic. It's not really, it, it, there's no real sort of logic to it other than at a certain point you have to get it done. And so you start and, and you look. It feels so effortless. <laughs> you listen to the House well, Junior Dragon scores and they just sort of just like they roll off the tongue, so to speak, you know. Um, I've, I've thought, I mean, that's good. That's how, that's what that's it should be. you do. want them to, exactly. Um, at what point during so don't tell anybody, Please don't tell anybody that it's very hard. I, I prefer that they think it was all effortless. <laughs> I'm sure it's not, of course. Um, at what point during a director's pitch to you, do you have your, your aha moment? Do you, you, you're, you're sold and you know you want to jump on board this project? Um, I mean, sometimes it's been the title. <laughs> oh, I remember Kung okay. Panda. Mm -hmm. I remember... Somebody mentioned Kung Fu Panda, and I thought, I've got to do that movie. That's going to be <laughs> So I had to do that. Um, uh, How to Train Your Dragon, I didn't know anything about. Um, and Bonnie Arnold, who's the producer, uh, gave me the books. And um, my ch my son at the time was uh, was just the right age for me to read to him from the books. And I I loved doing that. I, I thought that 
that told me a lot more probably about the actual the story than mm -hmm. than anything I could have. And at that point, the film would have been very rough. Um, so sometimes you you get you get the aha moment. Sometimes sometimes you get the aha moment when you're watching the premiere and it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you should have done. Right. Uh, but sometimes you get it because just the right confluence of things you know i mean the great thing about dean and and chris are that they they're wonderfully hands off and they only ever speak in the language of of story um and they speak in the language of emotion and they don't try and ever talk to you in musical terms mm. that's a strict strict no-no for me is that if directors try and talk in a musical term it means that i'm doing my job badly mm. if they if they're having to reach you across, yeah if they're, if they're, they're reaching across the aisle to try and speak my language then I well, why do they need me I, I should I should be making sure that I'm translating what they need correctly sure. um, so certain directors you have to you know and some directors can only speak that way they don't really they find it very uncomfortable to not talk about specific pieces of music obviously this is where temp comes in and I I've tried to I try and, I, I've, got, I've been to directors' apartments and houses and looked through their CD collections just to try and get an idea of what they listen to and how they listen to things and what their thought process might be with music. Because um, it's a very difficult thing to talk about. Um, the reason we all make music is that you can't say those things in normal language. Mm. And that's the whole point of art, um, especially music, because it's so vague. You know, you can one person can hear something and then they can hear their parents divorce in that piece of music and then other people other people hear the most erotic experience in that it's music they've ever had. Sure. Yeah. Sure. um with ferdinand we saw you behind the podium conducting and with the how to train your dragon trilogy we saw gavin greenaway conducting the orchestra how, how does that work is that a conscious decision is it a budgeting decision are there any um, reasons why you decide not to conduct on some occasions yes is it some occasions uh, it's going to be much better for me to have a, somebody who's, who's better at conducting than me, and most people are. <laughs> um, I'm not a great conductor. Um, Ferdinand and I went out, I uh, figured out a way of, um, there was so much pre-recording that in the sense that we did a lot, we did about two weeks of recording before we even hit an orchestra, which is all the, all the guitars and percussion and drums and uh, all these other instruments. So that stuff was all recorded in advance. So the, the orchestra was very much an overdub. Mm -hmm. And when it's an overdub, I, I I like approaching that the same way I would if I was sitting in my room here with a guitarist. The difference that it is that it's 60 players or 100 players it doesn't actually make any difference. So I, I figured out a good way of going out onto the podium for Ferdinand with kind of uh, a lot of gear, uh, a lot of Pro Tools um, faders by my side. So I could balance my I could balance everything more carefully. And I had... <laughs> I had headphones that allowed me to just get the feed from the microphones of the orchestra. And so I could balance it in properly. So I, I really felt like I could, it took me a little bit of time to get used to, but I could work the way I normally work, which is in the control room, which is balancing all the, the these other elements with the orchestra. And then by being out there myself, I could, you know, I could try things with the players very quickly as if they really were just somebody in the studio who, I, you know, would, asked to overdub things and try things with I, I love that kind of experimental process and I'd never really figured out how to be able to do it with an orchestra so but when it comes to sort of conducting freehand and you need somebody who's going to hit picture and the more technical side of conducting it's much better to have somebody as great as Gavin mm -hmm. I mean on Dragons we even had Eric Whitaker on the choir session mm -hmm. he did all the choir overdubs for us and that was fascinating I, I've known Eric for several years now and he's a wonderful conductor uh, but when he when you put him with a choir he really he somehow brings something out of a choir um, and he can figure out all these neat kind of um, sort of tricks to get get what you need um, changing where consonants lay and the, the sound of vowels and things in words um, and so, you know, I, I do a mixture of both. I think it depends on what, what's necessary. Right. Um, getting the chance to meet and have a sit down with John Williams is even the most seasoned composer's dream. Um, can you tell us a bit, a bit about your collaboration with him? Is he, as we all think he is, every bit as wonderful as his music? 
Yes, he is. Yeah, mm-hmm. very distinctive. He is exactly as, I don't know, sort of, he's very normal. That's the thing. And I think one of the things I found out on Solo was that he, he is just the same as every, everybody, all of us. He really is. Human. He doesn't, he's very, very human. Mm-hmm. He struggles the same way everybody struggles with everything. He, he, um, he thinks very carefully about everything. He he is obviously still hugely enamored with um, the music, you know, the process of making music, uh, which uh, I'd love to be at his age. Um, you know, it's it's a it's tough for me to do an action cue, and I'm only fifty four. So <laughs> he, um, it's extraordinary the energy that he he has when he writes, um, and. And it was it was a very interesting process. Uh, I I I was you know we we spotted the movie together, uh, which is one of the things I really wanted to be able to do is just to go through the movie and and have him talk about you know what he would see as the the ideals of of you know the thematic um, ideals and the and the development you know the development of those themes and what we could do with them and how they how they would in you know how they would work with the the actual, um, you know, the storytelling. Mm-hmm. And once we'd done that, then um, he went away and he wrote, he wrote a couple of themes, and I, uh, I would, I'd been working on some themes as well before that, and uh, and then once we spotted, I, I went into overdrive on that to try and, you know, we worked out what themes he was probably going to uh, provide, and uh, I worked out the themes I needed to provide as well. So. I then went to his house alone, no directors, no filmmakers, and he played me the themes, Amazing. which was extraordinary. You know, him sitting at the piano. And, uh, then <laughs> there was that moment when he said, and, and so what have you got? <laughs> so I pulled, pulled out my scrap of paper and I, and I'm, I play, I play badly for a viola player on the piano. I'm a bad pianist as a viola player. That's, that's how bad a pianist I am. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I, I, clumped, I clumped my way through something and he was very kind about it. And we talked about a few things and uh, and then we did a session in L.A. Uh, with a very large orchestra as a demo session for him to explore his ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, about six cues he, he, we, he worked on throughout the movie and one suite. Um, all by hand, uh, all, on, on, all sketched. Isn't, that's, that's the way he yes. works. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and his sketches are... are are very complete. Uh, Mark Graham kind of, you know, um, speaks. You know, he, he understands the language incredibly well. It's, it's all tiny, elegantly written hand notes and and uh, five or six lines of, of very clear orchestration. There's nothing missed out, really. Um, so we did one session, did five six cues and a suite, um, and then we took that away um, and looked at it. You know. Went went through it all with the filmmakers. And then I, I basically took all of the material that material and I programmed it into my um, my setup, mm. so that I could then take any of that material and use it. Um, right. And that that became the sort of the process. Right. This is a a funny question. Your your poodles Moose and Ozzy have become quite the social media sensation. Um, any chance we get to see some kind of score just for the two of them? <laughs> Um, they're so well, full of characters it's just their delight to watch yeah well ozzy is is actually johnny johnny's uh poodle um who's the engineer here ah, I see. um okay. the other one with the the fro is uh that's chase he's mine as well so so moose and chase are mine yeah chase and then ozzy ozzy is the um the golden one so he's like yeah I, I mean i used to you know we called this five cat studios because i started you know years ago uh, I needed a facility name, um, and I had five cats at the time, so it became Five Cat Studios. But they they're problematic having cats in a studio, especially five, because they they cause um, havoc. They jump on gear, they jump on the keyboard, they um, their their fur blocks up, you know, f- fan intakes and stops things working, and they can cause havoc on singing sessions when or any musician that's got uh, you know it's got to actually breathe um so 
this new version of five cat studios actually is it has no cats in it it's not no cats are allowed in it <laughs> unfortunately uh, but we got right. poodles because they're they are um you know they're they're sort of safe for, for those with asthma and they're very they're less judgmental as well less judgmental how interesting yeah to, well, that's a very it. judgmental if you've ever met a cat but they're they're, they're constantly looking at you like do you really mean that that uh, dimension <laughs> Board. Do you really think well, that's well, a good idea? Well, actually, I recall a very recent video of Moose on on social media, where he was just looking very nonchalantly about life, and suddenly he raised one eyebrow. Just yes, that's what he does. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, he's not he's not judgmental. He's he's uh, he's physical? just um, yeah. He just he's, he's very good for physical comedy. Yeah, <laughs> he needs his own score all for himself. <laughs> um, just, Movies with. James Bond in the 70s, I think, you know. <laughs> and just to, uh, to finish off a general question for and from the members of the Global Composers Network, um, what advice would you give to an aspiring composer and composers just beginning their professional careers in such a competitive and cutthroat industry, which is becoming much more apparent from social media? So many people want this place. Any, yeah. any words of wisdom? Well... I don't know. I keep trying to think. I'm pretty sure that if I was trying to start out today, I probably wouldn't make it. I think it's very, very much harder now. Um, that I had the advantage of being able to sort of slip in front of other people because of I, I had a technological advantage, which you know, I suppose technology always advances um, things. I think I think I, I I did hear about this on uh, on another interview that you t that you did. Something about, yeah, I mean, about remote control and slipping in somewhere or media ventures. Well, yeah, media ventures in those days. It, no, but it was before then, even oh, so really? even before I, when I started doing jingles, I, I just I had much more of an interest in technology. And, and I think that gave me an, an opportunity to uh, jump in front of very composers um, who were, you know, they were still stuck, you know, kind of on paper um, or, you know, or with more normal techniques and so I kind of picked up jobs that were based on just being able to you know program differently and, and make different sounds and have have um, libraries that nobody had at the time I just worked very hard at that side of it uh, and it just gave me an advantage at the time that was hard to find so every penny I ever made from leaving college for 10 years I never invested in anything other than gear um, and that, and that's, and that's very selfish. It's a very kind of selfish, especially if you have in a relationship and I was, and, and my girlfriend at the time who then became my wife, you know, put up with a lot of that kind of sort of selfishness. And that's one of the things that I've noticed is that it takes a lot of selfishness to be successful. So you have to, you have to find kind people around you who are willing to put up with that. Um, but also the thing I, would say is you know do not listen to anything in film scoring try and listen to music that is because <laughs> yeah. otherwise you know, the snake is eating its tail mm. you no know, any honestly anybody can sound like that stuff and that's not how you're going to get found you're going to get found by not sounding like film scoring of course. Of course. that doesn't mean you can't sound cinematic mm. and that's what you want to do is you want to create something that's cinematic that has never been used in cinema and then suddenly you become very interesting. I mean, I think, you know, Johnny Greenwood's a way more interesting composer than 99% of the composers who are doing films. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there's only so far his stuff perhaps might work for m more mainstream movies. But if you want to get noticed, don't try and sound like the mainstream because there's a thousand people in front of you who can do it faster, better, quicker, mm -hmm. and are probably closer to the to it you know um but making intriguing and interesting music that that has a programmatic bent to it that seems to tell a story that is has a mood and a vibe and has um has a, a story built into it that you can hear somehow um do that because and and that should come from anywhere else in the world other than you know what we all hear all the time 
you know, film scores have become very, very dull. I mean, they really have. I mean, if you think of the much more interesting period of time, I mean, it's always it's always the case that there's going to be a kind of a, a normal common sound of fashions. Um, and But how quick they change is the question at the moment with every film score being used to temp every other film score, which is then created, creates a very similar score, which is then tempted into another film. So now you're five, six you know, degrees of separation from an originally interesting idea. It becomes like a photocopy. It becomes bland. And if everybody is trying to sound like that, how are you ever going to get noticed? So here, here, here I am. I have my, I have my all, all my pieces, and they're all bland photocopies of everything you've ever heard in a movie. Does that mean I'm not talented? Well, it doesn't mean that you're not talented, but it means that you're not intriguing to anybody. You're not trying anything new. And whatever you think of Hollywood, it, it is got a lot of very creative people in it. And so if you're not creative, they're just going to assume that the guy who did it last time and did it for the film they liked and did it quick and did it on budget and it wasn't very interesting but it was fine and it worked very well why not just you know i'd rather spend 250 grand on them than somebody i don't know even if they are cheaper you know so be more interesting in them in your music to begin with so in essence what what you've just said a little bit is that the temps the temp scores are suppressing creativity to an extent do you think that the temps temps need to be abolished you can't abolish a temp because the temp is an incredibly useful part of filmmaking. It helps everybody figure out the film, sell the film, um, work out where the film is going, the tone of it. It's incredibly important. If you can get in and write the temp, uh, if you can get hired early enough and write the temp, then that's great. That could be the answer as well. Then you can be a... What's the difference really, writing a temp or doing the actual score? Because you can write something, you can write something interesting, <laughs> and it's not, not going to come out of um, you know everybody knows everybody's favourite scores. I mean, and then then it will be based on your new original ideas. It won't be based on on a sort of a, a commonality. Right. right. So I mean, it's it's rare. I mean, it, directors love that idea, but it's it's very hard to do because you are having to write against a picture that isn't there or isn't finished. Um, I mean, we do it all the time in animation. But I still sometimes wish I could wait until the end to write. But, you know, you, you have to get on and try and create these things in, in advance. Mm. But it's, it's also about it's not about the temp. It's if they temp if they temp with really intriguing and interesting music, then that's fine. But yeah. most of the time they don't. It's in red line. They, they, um, yeah, they just temp with the same old film scores. So. <laughs> yeah. John Williams doesn't. Uh, this doesn't allow temps, does he? Yet? No, he doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Having said that, I deliberately got them to temp all of Solo with only film scores by John Williams, okay, well, sure uh, or only, only scores from John Williams, yeah. And, um, and any of the bits we actually took and, and used were not temped in where they were anyway. We, we, I, I did sort of create, I create, you know, I created certain scenes where I, I kind of temped in, you know, bits of, of the old movies, but they had very specific reasons, and that wasn't really part of the temp process the temp process was to make sure that the whole tone of the movie felt like it was a star wars film uh, so that we could always be comfortable with that great well i'm going to let you get busy with your next project and we're looking forward to your very teasing previews on social media you know this one. like a quick tinkle of the harp was the last one you sent oh thank you very much <laughs> yeah, oh wow okay look, look at that just a that. glimpse into into John Powell's yeah. uh, DAW, fantastic. Yes, setting up the uh, various instruments and things like that. So. Amazing. <laughs> wow, well, good luck with that, and thank you ever so but much also, for your time. More oh, oh, more. See? A blank See how this... score sheet. Blank score sheet. That's fantastic. Is that going to get so... filled up with your own handiwork? It might do, yeah, I mean, I hope so <laughs> at some point. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Wicked. All right, I'll leave you to it. Again, thank you so much for your time. The Global Composers Network is absolutely delighted that we had the chance to interview you. And um, yeah, best regards. Pleasure.